I don't care where you're located, you can do a hell of a job, and I mean that literally. At whatever job you have, you can, you can take whatever job you have, and you can make it a real nice little piece of absolute misery. Or you can do, you can act like a civilized human being and notice that no matter where you are, there's a, there's a richness and a complexity that's completely inexhaustible right at hand. And then you can take that seriously, and you can say, well, I happen to be a waiter at the keg, and perhaps that's not what I expected, and, and he's a young guy, and perhaps that isn't where I want to end up, but it's not nothing. It's a rich environment, and I can make it a lot better if I want to. I can get along properly with my coworkers and not gossip behind their back, and I can treat my customers properly, and if an opportunity comes my way, I can take it, and I can see what happens. And so he said that's what he had started doing and that things were working out much better for him. He was in a much better job than he was three months ago. And three months, that's nothing, right? I mean, that's a nice trajectory. It's an uphill trajectory. And that's what you want, really. An uphill trajectory is actually even better than being somewhere good as far as I'm concerned. Because one of the things that really makes your life meaningful is the clear realization that you're headed somewhere better than you are now. And then it's even better if you also understand that there's a direct causal relationship between the things that you're doing and the steepness of that incline. And so I get a lot of letters from people like that. And they're more, most frequently young men, although not always. And they say, well, you know, I've been listening to these lectures and I decided that I'm going to try to take responsibility for my life. And so I'm, I've started to stop doing all the stupid things that I know that, that are stupid that I know I shouldn't be doing. And I've started doing some of the things that aren't stupid that I know I should be doing, which seems pretty obvious, really, if you think about it. But it, obvious though it may be, that isn't necessarily what people do. And then they write and say, you can't believe what difference that makes. And they're thrilled about it. And so I'm thrilled about it when I get letters like that because I, I really don't experience anything as better than a letter like that or a message like that because it's so good to see things that aren't so good replaced by something better and I really do think it's an open question I truly believe it's an open question to what degree we could make things better if that's what we actually aimed at doing you know in some of the stories that we've we've covered already the story of Cain and Abel in particular is really an analysis of that problem which is so remarkable it, it occurs so so early in this document it's such a it's such a foundational story and it basically says, well, there's two modes of being in the world, right? There's one where you adopt the responsibility for living properly, for being properly, and you make the sacrifices necessary for doing that, and then everything will flourish properly. And the other one is a pathway of resentment and bitterness and rejection and murder and genocide. And that just seems exactly right to me. And so... If the positive path beckons, if you can actually see what it is, if you can, if you can lower yourself enough to see what it is. Jung, Carl Jung said once that modern people didn't see God because they didn't look low enough. It's a phrase I really, really like because people denigrate the opportunities that are right in front of them. And, and there's no reason to do that because what's right in front of you is the majesty of being. That's what's right in front of you. It's inexhaustibly complex and full of potential and there's no reason to assume that wherever you happen to be isn't as good a starting place as anywhere else. Now, you know, I know some people have terrible, terrible lives. They're in situations that are absolutely unbearable. And, but I also do know that even situations like that can be made a hell of a lot worse by the, bad, by, by, by the worst kind of attitude. That's for sure. So, so anyway, so that's where you are. You're in a damaged structure. You're a damaged structure. You're in a damaged structure. But, you know... At least it's got some walls, you know, you're not being fed to the lions on a regular basis, so that's a good thing. And you can, you can emerge forward, you know, heroically, magically, to confront the chaos that constantly threatens the structure within which you live. And you can free something as a consequence of that. You can learn something, you can strengthen yourself. That's the other thing, because the way, what you're actually made of, in, in many ways, that, what informs you, what you're made of, is what you encounter when you voluntarily encounter the unknown. And so the more you voluntarily encounter the unknown, the more you get made of. And the more you get made of, the more there is to you. And then the more you're good at encountering the unknown and restructuring order and, and calling forth proper order out of the potential of being. And 
God, you've got to think, why wouldn't you do that since you can do that? And it's an endless mystery. You know, I think part of it is that people, well, it's, it's also encapsulated to stump some degree in the story of Adam and Eve. Because what happens to Adam is when he becomes self-conscious, right? He, he becomes ashamed of, his, of himself and regards himself as a lowly sort of creature. And there's endless reasons why people would do that. Because, of course, we're rife with imperfection. And so he hides from God. And I think that's actually the answer to the conundrum, which is that people don't aspire to the highest good because they're deeply ashamed of, of themselves and their weaknesses and their insufficiencies. And, and so it's, it's, that's not the only reason. I mean, there's, there's the desire to avoid responsibility and there's all the negative motivations as well, like resentment and, and, and hatred and, and the desire to make things worse. I, I don't want to, you know, give us, a, give us too much of a break, but, but it's something like that. But it's okay to, to not be in a very good place if what you're trying to do with that not very good place is make it better. And one of the things I really have learned as a clinical psychologist is that you just cannot believe how powerful incremental progress is. You can, you can do the calculations like, it's like compound interest, you know. If you make your life a tenth of a percent better a week, man, in two or three years, you're, you're in such a better place than you were that it isn't even like the same domain. And if you keep that up for 10 years or 20 years, you know, especially if you're young and you start early, you start to straighten yourself out and, and fix the things that you can fix, you can transform your lives in ways that are completely unimaginable. And God only knows what the upper limit of that is in terms of human possibility, because we are amazing creatures, you know, when we really...